This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 28th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three are these. First, we explain why, four months in, this year's Alaska budget deficit is already growing. Second, we talk about the new proposed North Slope LNG project. And third, as we head into the election cycle of 2020, we explain why we think it's important that Alaskans focus on the fact that the federal budget deficit is spiraling out of control. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, let's take a crack at your top three this week. Uh, yesterday, I knew you were going to have to take on that article since, hey, guess who was featured prominently as a commentator in the article? Brad Keithley. Um, but uh, this oil production and oil uh, pricing issue that we're looking at, the spring revenue forecast or the fall revenue forecast, rather, is about to be redone. We got some, uh, you know, we got some issues to look at here. We do, and I'm very happy that James Brooks uh, uh, took on the subject and uh, and wrote that article because it's time that that we start uh, waking up to to what's going on this year. Um, we do a tracker uh, every Thursday on our on our Facebook page and on our various pages. We we publish a tracker every Thursday of where oil production is relative to projections, and on Friday uh, we publish a tracker of where prices are, oil prices are relative. Uh, to projections, and both have been running. Both have been running low. Um, oil started off the fiscal year in July uh, high, uh, sort of unusually high, given where uh, where things uh, uh, usually are in the middle of the summer, uh, and then it sort of plunged, and it's recovered somewhat. Production levels have recovered somewhat, uh, and we're back up, uh, back up nearer. Uh, where we need to be uh, so far in October, but we're still running below uh, the projections that the that the state revenue forecast is based on, and and the oil component of the state revenue forecast obviously depends on a combination of production um, and price. the The thing about production is it is lower in the summer and in the fall, and then it sort of reaches its peak during the very cold months on the slope of no, November, December, January, February. Uh, March, and then it sort of uh, uh, slides off again. So there's still time to make up uh, on the production side. Um, and, and thus far, uh, the descriptions of what, I've, uh, of what I've heard about the reasons why we're running low are temporary, uh, more like temporary things, uh, uh, longer maintenance turned around, um, uh, not quite getting everything uh, put together for, for from new wells in, in the way that they anticipated, um, and so there's still some expect some some hope that we'll make up uh, on the production side, but the price side uh, the price side is not looking good since the uh, publish a, uh, a look at where we are on prices every Friday for people who want to follow this. Uh, the price side started out that the projection for the year is 66 dollars a barrel. That's that's what the revenue forecast is based on, um, and and we started out uh, sort of right at that in July, but since we we've, uh, we've been below that, and when you look at the futures market uh, for Brent, which is sort of the nearest crude that had that's widely traded uh, in terms of price to Alaska, uh, Brent has been trading away over the remainder of the fiscal year, 
And then you, when you look out beyond the end of the, this fiscal year and look out into the you know the next five years, which is what how far out the futures market goes, uh, the price remains uh, significantly below uh, the forecast, the revenue forecast that the Department of Revenue published in uh, uh, in in the spring. So all, so both of those, both price and, and, and production, are telling us that we're we're going to be running low on the lower on the revenue side and then there's some there's another piece of this that james didn't quite pick up in the article but but will in subsequent ones i'm sure uh on the spending side i mean we we started out the year uh basically knowing that we didn't that we didn't budget enough for medicaid uh for a variety of reasons um and and so there's at least some supplemental that's building on the spending side that will go the <laughs> low on revenues, high on uh, the, the, <laughs> need to be higher on spending. Right. Uh, on the spending spending side, that's uh, that's that's uh, that we know we're going to face uh, when we get when the legislature gets back in the spring. So and we've known that sort of all along. So uh, we've got um, uh, a, a a growing deficit, lower revenues, higher spending. Uh, for this fiscal year uh, that we're going to have to confront. And as I say, uh, both uh, uh, on the price side, at least oil price side, when you look out beyond this fiscal year, you can continue to see that that sort of divergence. And and that's all, I mean, all of that is, is a divergence from a forecast uh, that you could see in the, um, that you see in the, in the looking at the 10 year forecast uh, that the, the, the various parts of government have done. Uh, all of that is a divergence uh, from what already is a highly challenged situation. Al already is a is a, a a deficit situation, significant deficit situation. So so all, all of the all of the moving parts are moving in the wrong direction, um, uh, and against a against a baseline that we already knew was going to be challenged. So 180 to 280 million dollar reduction is the numbers that Brooks came up with here from the various entities and everything like that. This is after the fact that, I mean, even with the governor's cuts, initially $400 million, By the time the legislature was done, $800 million deficits. You add another $180 to $200 million on top of that. We're talking about a, we're talking about a billion-dollar deficit again. And this resistance that we've seen thus far from uh, the legislature and the powers that be outside of the governor and a handful of, uh, handful of minority members and some in the Senate, but it, not even all of those, to any kind of further reductions in government spending, so I mean we're kind of at a crossroads here. We are. It's going to be it's going to be a very difficult, another very difficult legislative session uh, next year. I think we've I think we've seen sort of, uh, and, and I think I said this in, the, in to, to James, and I think he picked it up in the article. We've sort of seen the bottoming out uh, of significant uh, cost reductions. I think that the experience that we went through last summer. Of the of, of the governor's budget cuts, and then the special session that considered those cuts came up with a a, a, a higher legislative higher than the budget uh, than the governor's initial round of budget cuts or initial vetoes, a higher spending level, and then the governor's second round of vetoes and 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 increasing the amount of spending uh, through that process. I think we've, I think we've sort of we're we're nearing the bottom. Uh, in terms of in terms of budget cuts, the governor couldn't even get 16. I mean, we've discussed this before on the show, but the governor couldn't even get 16 to uphold a veto of $750,000 to the Art Council. I mean, if you can't if you can't uphold a veto uh, of $750,000 to the Arts Council, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know where you're going to get another you know, $800 million billion dollars in uh, in spending cuts. Um, so I think we've I think we've sort of seen the seen the the bottoming out of the of of where you realistically can think you're going to be able to drive spending cuts, um, and unfortunately that's well 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 short uh, of of where our revenues are going to be. So there's a gap that's there that was there this year. There's a gap that's going to be there even worse when we get back in the spring, and and as importantly there's a gap a continuing gap uh, as you look out. As you look out into the future, um, and it's a um, uh, it, it, we, this this legislative session is going to be yet another difficult one. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the weekly top three. 
And Brad, I think you said something that um, I think you said something in one of your your Facebook posts that is kind of coming to fruition with what we're saying here is it's not a question of if they are going to tax us, it's uh, or if they're going to continue to tax us, it's how. I mean, they they are already taxing us. Uh, we're already seeing that taking of the PFD that is a tax. And the question is, is it going to be enough or do they take, you know, do they have to take all of the PFD to tax or is there something, I mean, is there something else in the wind? Because you start talking about a billion dollars and uh, I mean, th- th- it, there won't be much PFD left here pretty quick. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And that's the point. I mean, that's the point that, 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 that sometimes people resist, but is the truth. We've been taxed the last four years. That's what PFD cuts are. They are a specialized tax on PFD income that that hit middle and lower income Alaskans the hardest. We have been taxed. Uh, Whenever I talk to somebody who's, you know, been listening to Senator Von Imhoff, they go, oh, no, no, we're going to avoid a tax. You know, it's just a question of priorities and all the stuff that that she talks about. We have been taxed. I mean, the, the, the statutes provide for a statutory income, statutory distribution of what, in essence, are Alaska's version of oil royalties to, to Alaska's uh, mineral interest owners its citizens uh, and the PF and the and the government has been withholding uh, exercising withholding tax on those and diverting that income stream to government that is a tax uh, and we've been taxed the last four years and and here's here's the situation Michael that that we find ourselves in and we're going to continue to find ourselves in those who don't want to talk about other forms of taxation, those who don't want to face up to the situation we're in and say, okay, we're going to need a revenue stream. Let's talk about what's the right revenue stream and and continue to say, we're going to solve this through cuts only. Those who go down that road are, are <laughs> inadvertently, but are prolonging the PFD tax because what happens is we go through a session uh, we say cuts only. Some say cuts only. The legislature says, well, you know, goes through his process and says, no, we're not going to do cuts only. Uh, even with the governor who, and, and 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 even the governor hasn't proposed a cuts only budget. He proposed essentially to divert four hundred million dollars in local taxes to the state last year to to, to fix it on his end. Um, keep saying, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do cuts only, cuts only, cuts only. And when and if you don't confront the issue of what the right revenue measure is during the legislative session, when they get to the end, the easiest thing they're going to do or the easiest thing left to them is to just, you know, not appropriate essentially tax, not appropriate the full PFD, uh, keep that money in government uh, and and go on to the next step. And they can do that without the governor's involvement uh, because the way the PFD is set up, the legislature has to appropriate appropriate it. Uh, before the before the governor has any can get his hands on it, so the legislature essentially can tax on its own, doesn't need it doesn't need the governor governor uh, when they when they do it through uh, do it through PFD cuts, and we're gonna every session we don't talk about revenue every session we don't confront the issue the elephant in the room of how we're gonna of what's the right revenue measure to close this spending gap or right. close the close the gap. Is going to be another session that we're just going to that they're going to knee jerk to uh, to PFD taxes. So now, yeah, at, at some point we got to face up to that. Some is say that the elephant in the room also, of course, is the is that the oil taxations that we've been giving away our oil that SB twenty one has caused a large chunk of that to be diverted where it doesn't belong. And when you say looking at all tax options on the table, are you talking about a, an oil, a change to the oil taxation? Are you talking about a reversing of SB twenty one as well? Or a modification? What are you What are you seeing in that? Well, I think I think it's time, as, as we've said before on the on the show, it's time uh, to go through an evaluation of the of the oil tax uh, issue uh, and and reevaluate uh, SB twenty one. It's been five years. Uh, SB twenty one has worked well uh, in terms of, of of increasing production from the levels that we were otherwise projected where we were otherwise projected to go uh, under ACES. Um, and I think SB 21 deserves a lot of credit, but it's time to, uh, it's five years time to evaluate it again. And I think we'll find there are nooks and crannies um, uh, in terms of, of the SB 21 approach uh, that can be improved. For example, SB 21 uh, was predicated on 
uh, a federal income tax level that existed in 2014. The federal income tax, corporate income tax, has been changed was changed significantly in 2017, reduced significantly, and the state's gotten a small share of that, uh, but hasn't got uh, anywhere near uh, half of uh, of that of that federal income tax change uh, in a way that you would that that you would hope. Uh, the state would be able to do, uh, or half or more of the federal income tax change. So I think there are I think there are places to to look at oil taxes, but there it 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 is it is it is not uh, uh, going to produce a billion dollars in additional revenue as we talked on the show last week. Uh, current uh, production tax levels are projected to be around five hundred million dollars over the next ten years. Adding a billion dollar tax on top of that uh, would triple uh, the current tax rates and I and it's unreasonable to expect uh, anticipate that you can do that without having a, a seriously adverse effect on investment levels going forward investment levels and and with with an adverse effect on investment levels going forward production levels so that 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 would have the potential throwing us right back in SB 21 or I'm sorry right back in aces uh, with with rapidly declining production levels and rapidly declining revenue levels as a result of that. A snap. There, there's an opportunity there for, for some dollars that, that, can, that can mitigate, but to think we can close the budget gap through oil taxes is 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 being foolish. Snapshot, Brad. Uh, if you had to if you had to throw a dart at the board right now, how much do you think uh, new oil taxation would bring to the table? Three, four, five hundred million. Um, I've heard estimates. Uh, the high end of the estimates. Uh, Jesse Keel talked about it one time it being four hundred million dollars. Uh, I don't think it's that. I think it's probably two fifty, uh, maybe, uh, in terms of 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 the so, sort of the clawback of some of the federal uh, corporate tax uh, uh, decrease that the that the companies have enjoyed. Um, but I, I, it's not it's not even half. Uh, of the of the deficits that were projected to run. Okay, we continue with Brad Keithley now in the chat room. Um, Harold is having a coronary in the chat room here <laughs> over the over the thing here. The state, good lord, the state rebuilt the entire infrastructure and the oil companies bought back their shares. Listen to Brad Oil Company talking points. It's unadulterated garbage. Oh, Alaska is not an oil, Brad. Let the oil companies worry about investment returns. Is uh, Alaska is not an oils, Brad. I think he meant oil company. Not an oil. Yep, there he goes. Not an oil company. Uh, let all oil companies worry about investment returns. And your point to that is, I think, is what you're saying is that's what they are. That's what they will do. And it's about investment. It's about a lack of investment if they do, if they're not getting the returns and the taxation structure is not right. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the, the state is an input state policy. Uh, is an input to oil companies' decisions. They're looking for uh, uh, the best return. Uh, and if the state, uh, we found this out during ACES, if the state uh, takes uh, a big chunk of of, of the oil company uh, profits uh, and reduce oil company returns to less than they can uh, they can make elsewhere, they'll they'll just put the the capital elsewhere. And and it's and people say, okay, so what? Um, well. The so what is this? Uh, oil, comp oil, oil wells decline in production. You have to replace them with new wells. You have to replace them with, with new fields. Or and if you don't, you just have a have a fairly substantial decline curve. New investment uh, keeps oil production levels uh, up. If we don't have new investment, we suffer what we were suffering under ACES, which is a six to seven uh, seven percent decline. If we if we if we create the opportunity for returns uh, that attract capital to Alaska, then we are in the situation we're in now, which is about a an even to a, to a less than one percent decline over time. Uh, that's significant. That's a significant difference in production levels, a significant level difference in in uh, revenue levels going forward. Uh, and and state policy is is a significant. Uh, input to that. If if oil companies see that they can make better returns elsewhere, they'll put the the new investment elsewhere, and will suffer the decline. The decline curves. It's that it's that simple. You can't say you can't. Alaska can't say, um, and any state, any any region can't say. Well, we'll just set the levels at whatever we want them to be, whatever revenue level we want, uh, and the oil companies will will have to live with that. They don't have to. 
there are more opportunities, oil development opportunities out there in the world uh, than there are than there is capital to chase after them. Uh, and the capital will go to the best one and there won't be capital left over for the worst ones. It's, it's that simple. So to, to, to say that we'll just leave you know, leave investment policy to the oil companies is essentially saying uh, uh, that Alaska isn't going to uh, compete for that investment and we're just going to you know suffer the consequences of it. All right. Um, f- <laughs> no, you cannot make the connection with ACES and oil investment. That's not the reason for lower investment. The reason for lower investment was Alaska is a cash cow and not a new field. Is what Harold is saying. It's just it's just absolutely wrong. I mean, look, look, Prudhoe's on decline, Kaparik's on decline. We the reason we have offset those is because we're de- we're developing new fields. That's what Pika is. That's what uh, the stuff that Conoco is putting out west is. Those are new fields. That's what offsets the decline. That's what keeps production levels relatively constant across time. If you don't have investment in those new fields. Then you suffer the decline curve that that uh, that we have at Prudhoe and Kapark, and we saw that in very stark terms from 2008 to 2014. We saw the consequences of having a tax structure that 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 made us uncompetitive in the world for investment. As the rest of the world, as shale uh, and the rest of the world grew investment, uh, our uh, Alaska investment as a percent of as a percent of overall investment plunged uh, uh, to, to f- far below historic levels that Alaska had enjoyed. Uh, we saw, I mean, we, we've seen the consequence of that. SB 21 restored uh, returns to the old companies, restored investment incentives to the to the old companies. Investment return. We're we're now enjoying the the benefits of that. We're I mean we're we're on the we, we have to evaluate again what we want to do. But if we overtax, uh, we're going to uh, plunge those investment levels again. Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Um, Harold does make some valid points as well. I think about uh, the educational system. Uh, $1.6 billion in rising for 120,000 kids each year. The education formula needs to be addressed. That goes back to our cutting discussion, which I agree with. I think that's one thing that we shouldn't, it's one thing that we shouldn't let go um, uh, because, you know, that's one of the problems. But with all the reticence to cutting anything right now, we didn't even get into K through 12 cuts. That's a big issue. Uh, 20 seconds, Brad, you, you agree with that? Oh yes, spending spending's an issue. It's always been an issue, but but I think you know we didn't. The governor couldn't get sixteen to support him on cuts to the arts council. Come on, I mean if we can't cut the arts council, we didn't even cut we didn't even cut it a little bit. Right, we, we maintained spending to it. Right, exactly. We just finished up with a discussion of oil uh, production and uh, costs, what the uh, pricing is going to be, how it's going to affect us, a two hundred million dollar debt. In, uh, in our future revenues, potentially. Maybe some of that will be offset by a new LNG project. We don't know. Mead Treadwell's brought a new one to the table. How does that even figure into what we're doing right now? Brad, your thoughts on what you've seen so far on this new oil, uh, excuse me, this new uh, gas project from uh, from Mead Treadwell of tanking it and putting it off and running it around the, uh, running it through the, uh, off the offshore on the North Slope? Well, uh, the new LNG project is sort of taking advantage of of changes that have uh, occurred uh, in the industry over the last uh, uh, changes in, have, that have occurred in the in, both in the environment and the in industry over the last uh, over the last decade, uh, really. Uh, changes in the environment is sea, as we all know, sea ice uh, is not as uh, significant uh, an issue as it was uh, uh, before. Uh, and the opportunity for potentially having icebreaker uh, ice ice breaking tankers uh, be able to traverse the the the, the sea ice the Be- Beaufort Sea uh, and Bering Sea on 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 a continuous basis uh, is uh, uh, is is opening up um, so that's one change another change is there's been uh, significant uh, improvement in um, in ice breaking uh, technology and, and tanker technology, frankly, led in part by the Russians uh, as they've developed their ice breaking capacity uh, over uh, uh, in there in the in the Russian part of the Arctic. Um, and 
uh, it's uh, it's opened up opportunities that that haven't been there before potentially to uh, uh, ship uh, LNG off the North Slope as opposed to, to building uh, building a big pipeline. There's there's always been a shallowness issue uh, as well that uh, the the the, the Beaufort Sea is not very deep uh, at the at the North Slope, uh, and so there's always been the question of whether you're going to have to do massive dredging uh, in order to bring ships in, uh, even on a seasonal basis uh, before the sea ice uh, uh, issues sort of went away. Uh, and they're addressing that by uh, building an extended, proposing to build an extended uh, uh, pipeline out offshore. Um, 10 miles, maybe I, I forget the exact distance, uh, but an extended uh, line offshore uh, and ship the uh, and ship the LNG from from that point, as opposed to bringing the ships into um, into shore. That all that said, I mean it, it it it's it's taking advantage of technological changes. We haven't seen the economics on the project yet. Basically, what what was announced was a contract between a potential uh, purchaser. Um, and LNG develop, uh, developer, um, uh, a subsidiary of a Dubai-based company, uh, and Exxon uh, to do this project, uh, but we haven't seen uh, the economics on the other side uh, uh, of, of the transaction, what they would do with the LNG, what, what, what they'd be able to monetize the LNG for. We also haven't seen the Exxon contract, so we really aren't quite sure of, of what the economics are from the uh, from the purchase side, um, it is a it is a significantly smaller scale project than than the AKLNG project that the state has been pursuing. The state and the oil companies have been pursuing, uh, and that shows up in the numbers. Ed King did a a piece uh, a week ago that analyzed once the announcement was made that analyzed uh, the potential impact of of this particular project. And he showed uh, potential revenues uh, to the state of somewhere between $100 million on the low side and $400 million uh, on the plus side, uh, beginning around uh, 2024, 2025, which is what would what the proposed end date, uh, service end date, is, in service date is uh, that the uh, that the project developers have talked about. So, you know, at at $400 million, that would be a significant uh, contribution, even a hundred million dollars is a is a material contribution. Uh, but uh, my my look at the numbers, my look at at, at what, what's likely going to occur here, uh, would put the likely number at the lower end of that scale, toward the lower end of the scale. Uh, and at that point, it's a contribution to our to our revenue situation, but not a solution to our revenue situation. All right. One of the things that it <clears throat> didn't didn't get addressed really. Uh, although it did in passing in one of the articles, is the fact that the difference between an LNG line and this LNG tanking project is that the tanking project disallows, essentially, with the inclusion of the Jones Act, any kind of use by Alaskans of their own resource because you can't you can't put it on a foreign flagged vessel and then have it you know in Prudo and then have it offloaded at Nikiski. Uh, because of the Jones Act, you know, people along the line, people in Nome, people in any coastal community would not be able to really, you'd have to, it would be a logistical nightmare to have to try and get that to work because of the problem with the Jones Act. So it disallows Alaskans to use their own resource in that regard. Yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's not good news for Fairbanks. I mean, this, this, <clears throat> this isn't a solution to the Fairbanks issue, for example, where they're trying to get uh, gas up to uh, uh, up to the Fairbanks community, uh, Nome and and the western coastal uh, 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 cities uh, villages. Even if you had a solution to the Jones Act, um, it, you're not going to be able to bring those tankers into those ports, those size tankers into those ports either. So you'd have to do some sort of lightering uh, 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 process to offload a portion, a small portion of it, and the economics of that might be. Might be uh, might be significant uh, uh, as well. So it's not clear, even if you even if you didn't do the Jones Act. I mean, this has always been this has always been one of the issues um, with uh, with with the monetization of gas. There's been two parts to it. One is getting state revenue, uh, and the second is having gas available for uh, uh, 
interior Alaska and and other and potentially for other parts of Alaska. Uh, this this proposal is sort of the equivalent of the old if you go if you remember back this far the old Exxon over the top proposal that they had back all the way back in the Knowles era. Right. Um, and and that was they were essentially they were going to propose to build a pipeline over the top uh, between Alaska and Canada to a major uh, natural gas find over on the Canadian side and then build a single pipeline down through Canada, which was the cheaper pipeline option than coming through Alaska, build a single build a single pipeline for both sources down through Canada and feed uh, feed the gas down that way. Governor Knowles at the time said, uh, my way is the highway <laughs> and, right. and and essentially said, you know, we're going to we're not we'll, we'll never approve the over an over the top option because of its adverse impacts on on the use of the gas uh, inside Alaska. This is sort of uh, uh, yet another version of the over the top, except we're going the opposite direction, but another version of the over the top. And it doesn't have those those interior Alaska uh, benefits. Okay, we got about five minutes here if you want to take a crack at the uh, at the deficit issue, because I think it's still um, I mean, it's important. We're getting all caught up in all this other stuff, the impeachment discussion, this, that, the other thing. We're coming up to the end of the fiscal. We've got uh, we've got the debt ceiling and debt service needs to be addressed as well. We've got potential for a government shutdown. There's a lot of things in the wind here on the national level, which will affect Alaska in the long run. Well, it will affect Alaska in the long run is, I mean, Alaska has a substantial, as, as, do, as do a lot of states, has a substantial uh, federal revenue presence of, of uh, part of our budget, significant part of our budget, comes from the federal government. Um, but, but more importantly to me, this is this issue is important for Alaskans as they evaluate uh, the 2020 election cycle. We have uh, Dan Sullivan up for re-election, and we have Don Young up for re-election. Um, and and the question is, are Alaskans satisfied uh, with with where we are on this issue and others? But are Alaskans satisfied with this issue? And 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 I believe it should play into the decision process of of, of the votes on our federal representatives. The, the the federal fiscal situation is is getting out of hand. I mean, it's it's long been a problem, but it's it's beginning to spin out of control. In 2015, it, it, it was it had issues. We had issues during the first term of the Obama administration. But frankly, uh, we got those under control in the second term of the Obama administration. People sort of gloss over that because of how big the deficits were in the first term. But in the second term, we were getting that under control. By 2015, uh, by fiscal year uh, 2015, which began in, in 2014, uh, we had the deficit down below $500 million. It was at $440 million, and it was only 2.4% of, of GDP, which is a relatively low rate and, and a rate that you can sort of accommodate. Uh, now, uh, in the first year of the, of the Trump, the, the first Trump budget, which, which was fiscal uh, year 18, the deficit blew up from $440 million billion to $780 billion. It went from 2.4% of GDP to 3.8% of GDP this year, uh, with the just completed fiscal year, fiscal year 19, uh, the deficit has blown up to nearly a billion dollars. It's it's about uh, three thirty million dollars short of a billion dollars, um, and the and the GDP has blown up from 3.79 to 4.5. Uh, that's double uh, the rate it was uh, in, as a percent of GDP in 2015. And when you look out, you know I'm a big one for looking looking forward over the 10-year span. Uh, when you look out, uh, the projections are, uh, CBO projections, Congressional Budget Office projections, are we go from a billion-dollar deficit this year uh, with a 4.5 uh, uh, at 4.5 of GDP to a $2 billion deficit by fiscal year 2029 uh, with a 7%. Uh, at at seven percent of GDP, the, the the situation is spiraling out of control. We it has we have not had a situation of of four years of growing deficits, which we've now had since the early 1980s. We now have a deficit that that is higher than at any that is higher is the highest since 2012. We have deficit levels that are now routinely pro, uh, projected to be above four percent, five percent, six percent. Growing to seven percent, the historical average of 
of, of debt as a percent of GDP is around 3%. So we we are spiraling out of control, and I and I think I think this election cycle uh, is an important one for our Alaskans to sort of look at themselves uh, as they as they as they think about who they're going to send back to Washington. Look at themselves and say, are we satisfied with this? Um, because Dan Sullivan and and Don Young both have voted for the for the bills that have put us in this situation. Uh, are we satisfied with this, or do we want to to talk about a change? Uh, either either sending a message to them that they need to change, which is one option during the cycle, or thinking about others who would who would who would say they would bring change if they went to Washington. So I think I think this issue has more relevance to Alaskans than simply is it going to affect the the federal revenues that are sent back into the state. I think it has a direct impact on how Alaskans think about their voting decisions in the federal portion of our elections in 2020. Ben Carpenter to the chat room asks, are we to look for candidates who will promote less federal dollars to Alaska, which is what a balanced budget would achieve? I mean, in the long run? I mean, I think I know the answer to that, but what what do you say to that? Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, promote less federal uh, spending uh, generally. I mean, spending is is a large component uh, of, uh, of what's driving the situation. The, the, the Tax Act... The 2017 Tax Act cost us cost revenues uh, and 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 created a portion of the deficit, but a large portion of the deficit's being driven by by spending levels. So just like at the state level, uh, uh, spending spending is is a significant part of the burden and or a significant part of the problem, and we have to get that under control. And part of that means that there will be less revenues to come back to all of the states, including Alaska. Right. I mean, it's a short-term versus long-term fix. I mean, in the short term, Alaska loses money, but in the long term, the stability of the United States seems to be pretty important at that point. I mean, when you look at the long-term fiscal stability, that would make sense. Because if it if it keeps going unchecked and something comes completely unstuck, that federal money all goes away anyway. Well, and, and even more than that, Michael, I mean, basically what we're doing, we're not we're not dodging. We're not avoiding taxes. I mean, there's 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 no avoiding paying off for these deficits that we're running. We're simply shifting those taxes to our kids and grandkids and, and putting them in a situation where they not only will have to pay for themselves, but they'll have to pay off the credit card uh, balances, the credit card debt that we're running up uh, in our generation. So there, it's more than simply. Um, uh, it's more than simply, you know, a calculation of how much revenue we're getting into the state. It's what we're doing to our kids and grandkids. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're 20 seconds out. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Mike, Michael, as always, thank you for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.